Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I did, I have taught for, well, it's 40 years now. Good grief. Uh, so, I have talked for a living, which means that I can digress endlessly, often in random sideways directions, which is good for writing, but it's bad for a public presentation. And so I always prepare my spontaneous remarks, uh, which is what I've done, and I read them to you. Uh, besides, uh, spontaneity is in the arts and in most other places vastly overrated. Writers are not known for their spontaneity. They're known for the illusion of spontaneity. We prepare and we prepare and we prepare and we revise and revise and revise until every punctuation mark, every syllable is exactly the way we want it. So I prepare my poems that way and revise them over years, usually. And I also prepare the introductions to my poems, which is what I have prepared for you. Uh, I want to say a couple of things by way of introduction. Uh, because I am at uh, a school of mathematics, science, and technology, I want to say something about science and poetry to begin with. I was trained as a scientist, a behavioral neuroscientist. My PhD is in physiological psychology, which is now being called behavioral neuroscience. But I have for many years practiced the art of poetry. Both poet and scientist respect and are humbled by the natural world. One does not properly begin an experiment to prove anything. One investigates a problem. There are hypotheses, yes, but it is a bad scientist no scientist at all, really, who rigs conditions to confirm his or her hypotheses. In a like manner, the poet who does not trust the world enough, who will not allow himself or herself to be spoken to and through, that poet will fall short. That poet is likely to view language as a mere means of expression, not a tool of investigation, an instrument for exploring the unknown. Robert Frost says, it is but a trick poem and no poem at all if the best of it was thought of first and saved for last. Indeed, this is one of the most pervasive misunderstandings of poetry, that the writer knows what he or she wants to say and that the language is merely the means of saying it. The best poems follow the language toward discovery of and deeper understanding of what can be said. We want both scientist and poet working gladly with all their imaginative and methodological powers. Both scientist and poet work toward some kind of clarity. Frost says that a good poem provides a brief clarification of life, a momentary stay in the confusion. The poet will not discover the empirical complexities, cosmic or infinitesimal, that the scientist discovers. The scientist will not discover the experiential and musical truth that the poet discovers. But those who would make poet and scientist enemies must be recognized as foolish. For choosing to live in a diminished world, closed off from the astonishing riches of the varied understandings that might be theirs. That's my little sermon. I want to read a few poems for you now. Um, I taught college, uh, I taught psychology at a small college for 30 years. I used to show videos from an excellent series called The Mind. There was a segment about a British musician named Clive Waring who had contracted a virus that destroyed his hippocampus and temporal lobes bilaterally so that none of his short-term memories could ever be transferred to long-term. Clive was and is trapped in the present and the distant past, becoming ever more distant. You could tell him the same joke over and over, or the same bad news forever. He would always forget it. But he recognized his wife, Deborah, whom he loved deeply. And every time she came into the room, he would leap to his feet and embrace her as if he hadn't seen her in years, even though she may have left the room only seconds before. 
So the first part of this poem is a description of that. The second part of the poem is a brief gazel, a formal poem of Persian origin, made of couplets with a strict pattern of repetition at the end of the second line of the couplet. Forever. I will never forget Clive Waring and his wife, Deborah. Every term for a decade teaching intro psychology, I showed the same video. A virus had destroyed his hippocampus. He came home one day with a headache that would not quit. Three days later, he was shipwrecked in the past. That day he came home and the right now. Whenever Deborah opened his door, having left him only seconds before, Clive leapt to his feet. He hadn't seen her in years. He'd swing her in his arms. He would sing. In line after line of his diary, he wrote, Awake for the first time now, and I adore Deborah forever. Who will give us tomorrow forever? There's a moon in the window forever. What's the long night for, and who will tell us? There is no way to ask, though, forever. Will you think of me lost in the old house? How can I miss you so and forever? Will you wake in the night without sadness? There's nowhere to go now forever. And whoever I am, here's my answer. In our small boat, we'll row out forever. I admit to being a person who sings along with the car radio or the CD player. I do this only when I am alone. And then I may also do a little dance. By dance, I don't mean some dangerous whole body flailing about but merely a rolling of the shoulders and the head, a silly looking little move, but one not meant to be shared with anyone. After all, I'm alone. And I thought I was alone, sitting at a stoplight on Northside Drive in Macon, waiting to turn left, moving to Bob Marley's Exodus. When I looked to my right to discover a car full of young people, college age, who had pulled up next to me and were enjoying my performance, laughing very hard and imitating my movements. They were convulsed with laughter. I'm sure I made their day, maybe their week. Most often the experience of being a fool doesn't transform itself into poetry, but sometimes it does. The odd title of this is Dead, but there's a reason for that. You were dancing in your car caught slipping into the deep bass of Exodus, the spirit voice of Bob Marley letting your shoulders go with it. You would laugh too if you saw yourself and if you were someone else because there is a blindness in us all and here it is. You are ridiculous to the folks suddenly beside you in their car and who can't hear the song. It says, open your eyes. It says, are you satisfied with the life you're living? If you can't dance alone in your car to Bob Marley, you may be dead already. I believe that vehemently. I've always been intrigued by our capacity to project our wishes and needs onto something else. We see this so clearly in the many appearances of Jesus and his mother in the things of this world everywhere. Photographs of thunderstorms and forest fires, water stains on walls, burn patterns in bread. A long, long list we're all familiar with. Years ago, an image showed up on a Pizza Hut billboard on Memorial Drive in Decatur. And soon there were crowds praying beside the road. That road almost always heavy with the ungodly. Atlanta traffic. The title of this poem is Being, and there's a play on being in the middle of it. There they waited for the Beatitudes to come from the billboard. It would not be the first sermon to be delivered on Memorial Drive 
but whatever blessings this image bestowed, they were heard only in secret. A crowd did gather, the devout did kneel, holding photos of the ill and the lost, and they shed tears. They left their pleading notes. They prayed rosaries. Below the sign that displayed the face of Christ, a billboard for Pizza Hut. Something like eyes and a mouth and facial hair discovered in the pasta being raised on a fork. I saw him for myself as Christ, who appeared mad and bewildered and hurt, his blurred mouth ajar as though about to pray or curse, his face oddly skewed, his eyes dismayed, and he was my kind of savior. Blessed are those who are humbled and unashamed, who go down on their knees out in the open so close to the road. To the drivers who seem crazed by time, their faces set hard against one more day they can never redeem. <clears throat> Sometimes, perhaps because poetry is a spell against death, perhaps because it tries to hold the world as it crumbles, we forget the pleasures of poetry, the physical pleasures inherent in the rhythm and play of sound, the delight and likeness and surprise and recognition, the release in the unusual in imagery and association and story. Paul Valeri said that only a fool thinks a person cannot joke and be serious. One of my favorite things to read is The Onion. The following poem is an imitation of an Onion article from June 15, 2005, bearing the headline, Everything That Can Go Wrong Listed. And including a page of the article, page 55,623. I found the page entertaining. I wrote my own page, number something. Here it is. It's entitled Wrong. After a June 15, 2005 story in The Onion, everything that can go wrong listed. It begins with a fragment, it ends with a fragment. There is no end. Raucous laughter breaks out during the angioplasty. Grandma buys timeshare over the telephone. Your only witness wears a tank top. Tipsy white man tries to dance like Rufus Thomas. Psychotic neighbor makes you a giant valentine. Cousin Belcher's wedding march at rehearsal dinner. Pillow fight breaks collarbone. Home alarm impossible to shut off until couple returns from Rio. Tattoo artist improvises. Son changes name to Cool Breeze. Caress leaves bruise. Your mother wills the house to a rodeo clown. Parole board reads your folder. Yodeler next door goes for record. Snide nephew living with you proved right. New igloo still too small for in-laws. Ion imbalance causes poem. Professor interprets laughter as praise. Tricky backflip comes up way short. Haircut not like pouty models after all. Practical joke breaks federal law. Bank floor too slick to run on. Vending machine keeps Oreos. Mostly nudists on the long cruise. You realize too late what Rocky Mountain oysters are. State legislature goes into session. <laughs> Poetry should be fun, fun writing it. I had great fun with that and not through with that. I uh, urge you to write your own poem, listing things that can go wrong and see what it is that you have to put into it and what it means to put it in line so that it works like a poem because you have no uh, lack of material. You can produce material for that endlessly. It's just a matter of choosing it. Well, this, this swings to the opposite extreme, this poem does. When I saw on TV a few years ago that a small child had been abducted from a Kroger 
not a mile from our house, the grocery store where we did our shopping, and then that the child had been found dead. I kept entering the terror of that mother who had turned around to find her child gone forever. But it was more complicated than that. This poem entitled Love explores that word. Was there ever a word more violated than the word love? Made to serve as an explanation for anything, offered up as a sufficient reason for anything. Assumed to be of ultimate significance, imbued with transcendence out of necessity, taken as the fulcrum of the good life, the defining quality of God, but also the first excuse, the last refuge of a certain kind of scoundrel, love. A child disappears in the grocery store where we shop. The mother collapses at the meat counter. After running down the aisles, her daughter's name scraping the air raw. On the TV news, an old man who was there can't get the words out. The girl turns up in the tall grass not far off the road. And when I go to the store, the fish gape and eyeball, there is blood in the sawed bone. All this was years ago. And now I think of that woman too often. She smothered her daughter. She left her dead by the road. And she drove straight to the store for an evening of theater. But she was in love with a man who did not want children. There's that word again. One of the things that I enjoy doing and that I advise doing is writing poems that are imitations of the work of another poet whose poems you admire. There is nothing wrong with this. This is the way to do it. It may be the only way to do it. You can't be original without being derivative first. Otherwise, you do not know the medium in which you're working. So I read other poems. I read them and I read them. I read them every day before I start to work. And I work in the mornings, but I read poems first to let me know what it is that I'm trying to do. Here's a poem that I have uh, written a riff off of. I, I, rather than imitations, what I'm writing now are riffs. Take one line, one word, one thought, the tone of the poem, and write a riff off of it. So here is the famous poem that, from which my riff comes by Walt Whitman. When I heard the learned astronomer. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I, sitting, heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out I wandered off by myself in the mystical moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. Well, some science you can only do in microscopy, some science you can only witness on a screen, projected onto a screen. Some things you can only experience firsthand in a lab or a lecture hall. I studied the brain, I studied neurons, I studied the membrane, I studied ion uh, transport, membrane permeability, uh, dendrites and axons, and uh, dopamine transmission and norepinephrine transmission. That's what I studied. And when I watched these lectures, uh, I was fascinated by what I saw when I, when I watched uh, films of how this was done. And so this is about uh, going into one of those lectures. But it begins, it's called Praise, and it begins with uh, Whitman's line, but then it goes on from there. Praise. When I heard the learned astronomer, I realized I'd walked into the wrong lecture. So I left and wandered the halls, finally asked someone for the right room. 
And there it was, the wilderness, already on the screen when I sat down. Hallelujah for the ions. Messiah's out of never. Let the species say amen. Let every human give praise to the membrane, the delicate skin of the spirit, and to the stars, yes, forever out there. But we are here still in our only time, humbled by our own selves, our little travels, our Easter's of each day. We are the very electrons of the uncanny. We are the liquid, tricky beats that we can't keep up with. Salt of love, oh little thought, how excellent you are. Slow down here in the dark. Another riff comes from Wallace Stevens' poem, Anecdote of the Jar. Now I'll just read the poem, I won't gloss it. You've read it, you, don't, you sort of know what it says although nobody ever knows exactly what Wallace Stevens is saying. He said that a poem should resist the intelligence almost successfully, and he accomplishes that most of the time. Anecdote of the jar. I placed a jar in Tennessee, and round it was upon the hill. It made the slovenly wilderness surround that hill. The wilderness rose up to it and sprawled around no longer wild, the jar was round upon the ground and tall and of a port in air. It took dominion everywhere. The jar was gray and bare. It did not give of bird or bush like nothing else in Tennessee. Tennessee. But there will come a time when the jar out there on the hill says nothing at all. When the jelly jar, scoured of every sweet molecule, or the wide mouth pickle jar, words pressed into its side, lies there as wild as the blind salamander that crawls all over it. And whatever those words once said, they can say that no more. Take the plain mason jar, delivered to my father's table the year he died. Or take the headstone engraved with 1989. Take the grave itself, any grave, or the road, or the sky, there will come a time when each of these has no way at all to mean there will be no Tennessee. Say a house settles and creaks as if set adrift, it will hold no sadness. In that wild place, there will be no wilderness. One of the main ways I taught myself, I, I, I think this is probably a good one to end with, and then we can have some questions if you, if you have them. Um, one of the main ways I taught myself contemporary poetry was by reading reviews in literary magazines. I advise you to do this. I, I read Poetry, the Hudson Review, the Georgia Review, American Poetry Review, all of these, I have them listed. I read them. I paid respectful attention to the views of all the critics, since I was sure they knew more than I did. This method has its drawbacks, especially if one takes to heart the negative biases of the reviewers. Some say avoid the first person, some say avoid the second, some say avoid the third. Nothing is left but paralysis and silence. And I was almost there, and when I read a review in poetry that said there were too many men writing poems with birds in them, I had a little breakdown, and I wrote this poem attempting to exorcise the voices that told me everything I might try to do was wrong. It was published in the Georgia Review and then reprinted in Harper's, after which I got letters from people who apparently did not understand irony. I also got support from people who did not understand irony and who thought I hated poetry as much as they did. This is called Preface to an Omnibus Review. Do not write poems about poetry. Commit no epigraphs, object poems, homages to anyone. Please, no more elegies for your father. No details of your grandmother's hands. Leave the sepia photographs alone. Give us no Guggenheim and here I am bored or overwhelmed poetry. Don't write about divorce. No ironic meditations at the playground or the game. Nothing on the limits of the language. Construct no ugly poems, ragged on the page, but nothing square. Go easy on the birds and the trees. 
no asleep in the deer stand, waking to an eight-point buck, only 30 yards away kind of poetry. And no remember that cafe in San Diego poems of heartbreak, not one Rilke imitation, nothing modeled on the Spanish, nothing spoken as Osip Mandelstam or Ikmatova. If ever on a clear summer night there's a baseball diamond in a small town, a field lighted like a scene in a glass paperweight, an old man loud in the stands. Don't even think it. If there's something you believe in, have the decency to keep it to yourself. No revelations, no irate manifestos on the bed, or on the earth or deconstructions of the bed, no uppercase God. There should be no nuns no old Baptist hymns in your poetry. Employ everything you need to make it happen, that momentary stay against confusion, but include no catalogs, no dogs. That's it. Thank you. Well, I'll take any questions that you might have. If you don't have any, I'll threaten you with another poem. I'm serious. Yes. Um, probably the last one that I read uh, because it's got some humor in it. And uh, I try to write the most serious things with humor. And the fiction that I write. Uh, I always feel I have to include humor, but I never can plan it. It always sneaks up on me. You know, you don't really know what's going to be funny until it happens to you. One of the hardest things to try to do, and this does relate to poetry, uh, is to try to write a joke. If I were to say to you, uh, write me a poem, well, you, could, you could knock something out. You could do it here before lunch. But if I said write a joke, and, and, oh, and make it funny. What are you going to do? It, you would have to structure it. It would have to have timing. It would be, have to be concise. And it would have to pay off at the end. Well, the former poet laureate of the U.S., Howard Nemirov, has a wonderful essay entitled On the Likeness of Poems to Jokes. And he talks about how a poem is really like a joke. It must have a payoff. It must be timed precisely. It must be economical. And there is a real poem, and there is a fake poem. We all know that there's a real joke, and there's a fake joke. It doesn't matter how much people tell you, oh, but that's a joke. Come on. You can tell me it's a joke all you want to, but I know whether it's a joke or not. Poems are like that. There are real poems, authentic poems. It's not arbitrary. It's not a bunch of language put on the page. It doesn't come all the way to the margin. It's a real thing. And uh, that's not what you asked me, but that's where I went. <laughs> yes. On the legalism your first reading, you mentioned that poetry was a spell against death. Yes. <laughs> I think that uh, very many of us are hurt into poetry. That death hurts us into poetry. Everything that we do as writers, and what we do in our lives really with our significant stories is that we shape time. Story always has a beginning and an end. Your story has a beginning and an end. Mine does. When we tell stories and we tell and we write poems, we may write them as narrative poems, which tell a little story in which something changes, or we may write them as lyrics, which freeze time. Which is in which the material is the same forever. So when you freeze time or you capture time in a significant way, when you make it kairos, which is significant time, as opposed to chronos, which is just one thing after another, you know that significant time in your life. You're in high school. This is part of it. Uh, significant time in your life. Significant days during the year. You know that that day reaches into the past and reaches to the future. and That's significant. Well, what a poem tries to do is to take a moment and freeze it so that it reaches into the past, holds the present, reaches into the future. Uh, and in that, death is not with you. It's, it's out of time. You're with that. 
It's also true that art quite often proceeds uh, from a wound. It doesn't always have to, and too often you find people trying to cultivate a wound so that they believe they can do the romantic thing of being the artist and writing, and that's a mistake. Uh, you don't want to cultivate a wound, but everybody is wounded by time. And so a spell against death, a brief stay in the confusion, uh, a brief clarification of life, all of these are ways of handling time, which is what we must all deal with. So that's something about what I meant. Yes. I never intended to be a poet. I was uh, <laughs> gosh, I'm old. Uh, <laughs> I, when I was in high school, I, all I wanted to be was an athlete, and I was an athlete back in the bad old days. I was a basketball player. I played for Monroe Area High. We played Central Gwinnett, which I was asking if that's still such a school around here. Uh, North Gwinnett, we played. I was an athlete. Then when I got to college, I realized, well, I wasn't such a great athlete. Uh, I was at the University of Georgia, and they had no use for me as a basketball player. Uh, I started to study hard, but all during this time, I'd been playing music because I was a guitar player and played in the old, when I thought I'm old, I'm thinking the old hootenanny folk scene. I was in that. My brother and I and another guy would travel around going to these, playing in these hootenannies, whatever that is. And, uh, then I had a rock band, and it was, we knew about eight songs. Uh, and <laughs> I tried to write songs and kept trying to write songs. I still try to write songs. Uh, but I became a poet out of writing songs when my ability with words transcended my, my musical ability. And, you know, Willie Nelson may say three chords in the truth, but three chords won't take you very far, really. Mine were not taking me far. So I started uh, writing poems, just writing the lyrics, song lyrics. Then I quit trying to make them songs, and I started writing poems without reading poems. You can't do that. All you make is bad stuff. And when I started reading seriously, uh, I realized that I love the making of poems. I love the making of poems, the working on poems. Once you see it published, you think that publication is what you want. And of course, you do want publication, but that's a little death, really. You're done with that then. It's the making of it. It's, the, it's saying something you did not know you could say, seeing something that you did not see before, telling yourself a story that you don't know, that you already don't know, not just regurgitating things, but making up things that entertain you. And in the same way, I got off into writing fiction because I was working with words, and then it came to me that uh, I might like to write something longer, and so I wrote, wrote some fiction. But poetry is, is what I really like to do. And, uh, I, I guess I should say, I, I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church. I grew up studying the King James Bible, reciting the King James Bible, singing hymns, going to church every time they opened the doors. And uh, I still think that the greatest poem in the language is the book of Ecclesiastes. I still believe that. And if you go back and look at it, you will see why what is in Ecclesiastes was true then. It will always be true because it's an existential document. And that's something that I would aspire to, would be to write something like that. So it's not a simple answer, but that, what I've said is the truth. Yes? Well, you're, the sciences you're exposed to here are, I'm sure, very far beyond me. I mean, really, I used to try to keep up with literature in my own field and couldn't do it. I can't do it. Uh, what I would say is this, is that science, uh, the humanities and the sciences 
complement one another. The best poetry takes into account current knowledge and current awareness, but you can't do science in your poems. You can't do it. It won't work that way. The humanities do not move. Literature does not move. It always stays at square one. And it explores that square endlessly. The sciences move. The sciences advance. They must advance. They are our hope. But you know, when Einstein made his great discoveries, he had to go home. He didn't stay out there in some ether. He had to go home and sit down in his chair, eat his meal, talk to the woman he loved or didn't. He had to deal with the passing of time even though he had malleable time. He was in the world of a human being even though he was this genius beyond genius. He was a human being. The humanities, literature, poetry deals with passage of time, birth, love, uh, moving through the day, time passing, what we, what we value, what we cherish. Everybody does that. That never changes. It may come that someday science will obliterate death for us, but that's kind of an awful, awful prospect, actually. So uh, what I'm quoting, what I'm citing there is an article by Northrop Frye, the famous literary critic who wrote this in Science Magazine um, many years ago. Uh, it's it particularly exciting to me to talk to this group, maybe become scientists, because when I go to a university library, and I, I go as much as I can, I look at the current literary periodicals, but I also go into the sections where the psychology and neuroscience journals are, and I read those journals too to try to to stay current with what's happening. That's how I know I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't do the math. I can't do the physics. I can't keep up with it. But uh, it, it makes no sense not to understand both the temporal side, which is the humanities, and the side which is cutting and advancing and carrying our civilization so far. You have no idea. I, I, remember the, I remember going into a lab at the University of Georgia when I was in a statistics class and hitting a key on this little instrument and being stunned that it would take the square root of a number. And people would, you know, people would come in by the desk. They were all, look, look at this thing. It'll take the square root. And now, these things you're carrying around in your pockets will do anything. You have no really, really no idea how phenomenal that is, how far that is, and how astonishing it is to a person like me. Um, so I think science is our hope, but without the humanities, it's, it's not, nothing really. We won't know what to do with it. So I would say embrace poetry, but have a clear eye, know what it is that you want to do. And if it's science, more power to you. Science is so broad, like, like there's a science. So many sciences. Notice I'm not mentioning math. I can't do anything with math <laughs> at all. I had a poem here that I didn't read. I know we're out of, we're out of time. The speed of the neural impulse was once estimated to be 60 times the speed of light. That's what scientists of the time thought, 60 times the speed of light. Think about that. The speed of the neural impulse is 100 meters per second. Now that's a mistake. That's a magnitude of error that you can hardly imagine. And the reason was that people thought the mind and the soul were the same thing. And so what they were thinking was that thought, human thought, moves at the velocity of the soul, which must be faster than the speed of light. What they failed to do was to say, wait a minute, we're human. We are human. We're, we're humbled by our humanity. And, and 
So I think that's the other side. It was a phenomenal thing to measure the speed of light and to measure the speed of neural impulse, but also to discover we're not what we thought we were. We're, uh, we must be more modest than that. The more I stand up and talk, the more I feel like I'm giving a sermon, and that's the last thing I want to do. So unless there's an invitation or something to be given here, <laughs> our collection plate to be passed, I will thank you and uh, wish you a well.